government. We will now host the KPC Korea Policy Forum with Minister of Environment Han jong e Today's Korea Policy Forum is aimed at communicating Korea's major environmental policies to the foreign press and foreign governments and share opinions and views. This is hosted by the Ministry of Environment, the Ministry of Culture, Sports and Tourism, and the Korea Cultural Information Services. Uh, the policy forum is broadcast live through the YouTubes of the KTV Arirang TV channel and the Ministry of Environment. And due to the COVID-19 situation, we have 18 members of the foreign press on site following the order of their application. For the members of the foreign press who cannot attend on site, uh, you may also log on to our YouTube channels and our messengers to submit your questions. And we will first have the opening remarks of Minister of Environment Tan jong e and then the presentation on Korea's carbon neutral policies implementation plans by the Deputy Minister Hwang seok tae of the Living Environment Policy Office at the Ministry of Environment and the following Q&A session. We have members of the co-host organization, uh, MCST, and also uh, Director Park jong yeol of, uh, of the KOCIS. We also have Ambassador Rodrigo Coronel Kimroch of Nicaragua. We also have Sir Daniela, uh, Ms. Daniela Petrova, the head of the Commercial and Economic Office of the Bulgarian Embassy in Korea. And also we have Mr. Samson Abebe Talila, the first secretary at the uh, Ethiopian Embassy in Korea. And we also have uh, other attendants here with us, both online as well. And we have Mr. Han jae of the Ministry of Environment and also uh, Deputy Minister Kim Young hoon of the Nature Environment Policy Office and Deputy Minister Hwang seok tae of the Living Environment Policy Office and Director Oh il Young of the Air Quality Policy Division of the Ministry of Environment as well. We also have Director Che Min Ji of the International Cooperation Division at the Environmental Ministry. I'd like to first introduce Minister Hwang jong e of Environment. Uh, she uh, graduated from Busan University and studied at the Nottingham University in the UK for uh, and studied industrial engineering. And she has been appointed as Minister of Environment last January and uh, served as the Assembly Member in the 20th, 21st and the 22nd National Assembly. And from 2016 and on, she has been the co-head of the National Assembly Climate Change Forum and also served as the co-head for the uh, rights and welfare of animals in Korea. And with that, I'd like to invite Minister Han jong e for her opening remarks. Hello, it's nice to meet all of you today. As was just introduced, I am Han jong e the Minister of Environment. Good afternoon. I'm pleased to have you here at this policy briefing session for foreign journalists. We invited you today to introduce Korea's environmental policies to bring happiness to our people, both who are living today and who will come to live in the future. Since the launch of the Moon Jae-in administration, the Ministry of Environment has been pursuing a bold shift in our climate and environmental policies targeting fine dust reduction, Green New Deal, and carbon neutrality. Entering the fourth, well, we've concluded the fourth year and we're at the fifth year of its term, uh, the environment and climate actions taken by the Moon administration have begun to produce visible progress, especially our policy measures to control fine dust and reduce greenhouse gases are clearly showing their effect with measurable improvement. In 2019, for the first time in record, Korea's greenhouse gas emissions declined by 3.4 percent, which suggests we have passed our emissions peak. When it comes to fine dust, our all-out efforts, including legal and regulatory reforms, an introduction of a seasonal PM management program have resulted in cutting 26.9 percent of PM 2.5 from the 2016 level to 19 microgram per square meter on average. But the challenges confronting us have never been this severe and urgent. 
Climate crisis we are observing today is calling for collaborative actions of the international community for the very survival of our humanity. Carbon neutrality is the only path the world has to take all together. Countries are joining the pledge for carbon neutrality as it is an, in an inevitable choice if we want to sustain this planet. As a responsible member of the international community, Korea has also got on board. On October 28th last year, Korea announced our commitment to striving to become carbon neutral by 2050 and submitted the long-term low emissions development strategy LEDs. We are now preparing a 2050 carbon neutral scenario based on which key policy strategies will be identified. At the Leaders' Summit on Climate last week, Korea announced our plan to raise the 2030 NDC during this year and to end all public financing for new overseas coal-fired power plants. Given the conditions and circumstances Korea is in, however, our journey to reach carbon neutrality would be a very tough one. Manufacturing remains Korea's industrial backbone, holding a much larger portion of the national economy compared to that of the EU and the U.S. Moreover, many of our major growth engines, such as steel and petrochemicals, are large carbon emitters. Considering Korea's compressed industrialization history, which had only begun at the end of the 19th century, our timetable from peak to net zero emissions is much tighter than that of Western industrialized states. Still, we've decided to take the path. We have established carbon neutrality as the milestone to be reached. Next month, from 30th to 31st of May, Korea will hold the P4G Seoul Summit, which will encourage the international community to join the journey towards carbon neutrality. The Seoul Declaration will be the summit's outcome document, which is to demonstrate a shared commitment of participating countries to climate action and uh, under the theme of inclusive green recovery towards carbon neutrality. We look forward to much interest from the international press in the P4G Seoul Summit. Although we have a limited time today, I wish to have an open discussion with you on what we are doing for responding to climate change, building a carbon neutral future, and addressing various environmental concerns. Thank you. Uh, we listen to the opening remarks of Minister Han jung of Environment. And next, we'd like to invite Deputy Minister Han Doctor of the Living Environment Policy Office at the Ministry of Environment. Uh, he studied at the Yonsei University, and after his graduation, he also received his master's degree from Seoul National University and also studied at the uh, Indiana University of U.S. and received his master's degree as well. And he started his public service in 2006, and in 2008, he also served as the Air Quality Director. And also, starting from last year, he has been appointed as the Deputy Minister of the Living Environment Policy Office under the Ministry of Environment. I'd like to invite uh, Deputy Minister Wang seok for his presentation on Korea's carbon neutral policies, implementation plans, and P4G. Just when I introduce, I'm Wang seok It's a pleasure to meet you all. And I'd like to go over uh, the PPT materials to introduce Korea's major environmental policies. Uh, my presentation will mainly be composed of two parts. The first is on the overall progress in our environmental policies, and the second part is uh, focusing on Korea's carbon neutral policies. Good. For the details, I believe you have a more detailed uh, given out uh, brochure, but this will cover the basics. Uh, first on the fine dust or particulate matters. I'm sure those of you, for those of you who have uh, lived in Korea, you will all understand that during the past, in the past two to three years, we have seen a massive uh, or a dramatic improvement in the, the concentration level of fine dust. And so when you look at the PM2.5 concentration uh, against the 2016, we see a reduction by 27 percent during the past four years. And also for the number of days that have good uh, PM2.5 uh, with a concentration level less than 15 a microgram per cubic meter. So we have uh, seen a triple increase. And for the number of bad days, we have seen a reduction of 56 percent. There could be many contributions factors, uh, but mainly it is because the government, focusing on the Ministry of Environment, uh, implemented various uh, fine dust reduction policies. Uh, and for example, for the uh, coal fire plants over 30 years, so we plan to shut 10 of them within this year. And starting from December to 
March for the three for the actual four months, we implement the so-called seasonal uh, ma management uh, policies. So for this period, uh, we will see the operation of 30 coal fire power plants, and also during the peak, we also uh, reduce the operation level during the peak season up to 80 percent. And for massive construction sites uh, or massive operation sites that are big emitters, we have applied the TMS, which is a real-time monitoring system. We have seen about a 49 percent reduction in their uh, emission as well. And also, we, for about 6,200 small-scale operations, we have uh, applied a new uh, emission and production, uh, prevention of facilities and uh, installation. And also for the outdated cars, we have uh, made, we have abolished them, about one million of them. And we also applied the so-called DPF-4, which is a filter to mitigate the emissions so that we could uh, reduce the level of emissions coming from the transportation. And also, we motivate and mobilize about 1,000 officials to strengthen monitoring and surveillance. And also for the household boilers, the nitrogen oxide was another main factor of emission. And uh, we have uh, switched those, about, those to more environmentally friendly boilers, and this amounted to about 700,000 units. So based on these policy implementations, we could uh, bring down the level of fine dust. And for the greenhouse gas emission, in 2018, just as Minister mentioned, uh, we have peaked in 2018, and uh, about 600 million, about 700 million was the overall level back then. And this peak is uh, very significant in the year of 2019. Out of the 700 million tons, this stands about 11th in the world. In China, uh, this stands at about 12 billion, and U.S. stands at second, about 6.7 billion, and Japan, 1.2 billion, and Germany, about 800 million tons. And that is the overall ranking in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So in 2018, Korea marked its peak in its emission. And another uh, c uh, committed uh, policy is uh, the non-polluting vehicles, such as the EVs, uh, the fossil fuel EVs and electric uh, battery EVs. And we also plan to increase our level of uh, supply. Uh, so in terms of EV, uh, 3 million, and for the hydrogen cars, uh, 850,000 is our overall plan. And for the details, uh, you will also be aware of the infrastructure, mainly the chargers. For Within this year, we plan to increase the number by double by double, so for this year, 1.8 million, and for next year, 3.5 million, and in the following year, we plan to increase the number by to 4.5 million. And another major policy we're focusing on is related to waste. Due to the COVID-19 situation, we also have a massive uh, amount of uh, medical waste, which could be prone to a secondary infection. And so we are implementing a very strict uh, management and control. And also for illegal waste measures, we have been we have uh, strengthened the liabilities and punishment for such illegal actions. And also related to plastic waste, so we have banned the use of single-use plastic bags in large retailers. And for single-use drink containers, we have been implementing a deposit system. We also restrict the repackaging, and we have also implemented various measures to bring down the overall amount of waste in Korea. I'm sure you're mainly uh, interested in our uh, carbon neutral policy, so I'd like to move on to that part of my presentation. These are the statements made by our president, and uh, the president has said that, I mean, if you look at his statements, you will understand how Korea sees our commitment to carbon neutrality. Together with the international community, that's an important uh, statement from our president. And as part of the efforts to actively respond to climate change, as a responsible member of the international community, we will strive to become 
carbon neutral by 2050. So that is our commitment from the president himself. And also, and carbon neutrality is not an option, but a must. So the fact that it is a must is very important. And another important statement would be humanity survival for the sake of survival and the future of the Republic of Korea. And as you know well, Korea has successfully industrialized with a focus on the manufacturing sector, and we have continued to increase our economic competitiveness, but this has led to high emissions. So our future will be changing dramatically because of the need to reduce our emissions. So it's not an option, but a must for Korea again. And carbon neutrality policy is something that has to be implemented consistently and vigorously in one direction. And we need to establish a solid framework for carbon neutrality, according to the president. So until 2050, well, we will be having seven presidents, including the current President Moon. So the ta carbon neutrality will have to be pursued under seven administrations. And so this current uh, administration is doing the work of establishing a strong foundation towards this goal. So it's going to be very difficult, but it is a path that we must take. So there is the president's commitment as well as the government's commitment to overcoming this difficulty to eventually reach this goal. Another thing that I want to explain to you is that, well, when you say GHGs, uh, in global history, 1750 is when global emissions first began to increase because industrialization uh, began in England at that time. So if we're going to have net zero by 2050, that means that we will be emitting for 300 years before we have net zero. So from Seoul to Incheon, we had our first railway, the Gyeonggin Line, back in 1899. So for Korea, we will have to make our GHG emissions net zero in 150 years, so which is just half of global history. And as I mentioned earlier, the peak year is very important. In the case of EU, it peaked in 1990. So it's going to, it has 60 years to reach uh, the 2050 carbon neutrality. The US 43 years, Japan 37. Whereas for Korea, we will have to have net zero in just 32 years. So compared to the European countries, we will have to speed up our reduction process twofold. We have to be twice as quick as other countries. Manufacturing takes up 28.4% uh, in our economy, which is the highest in the world, compared to Japan, our neighboring country. Japan has 20.3% manufacturing, so we are much higher. And among those, steel and petrochemicals take up 8.4%. These are the energy-intensive industries. And so we are faced with a very challenging goal, which we must implement. On October 28th of last year, uh, our president announced our net zero plan. And uh, since then, we ca came up with the carbon neutral strategy action plan. And there are 10 key tasks under three policy directions. So we begin with energy, in this uh, transport, building, and other different sectors that are emitting GHGs. So we have ha we have established a broad framework and we have the Office of Government Policy Coordination leading a government-wide task force uh, and which is establishing our action plan. And late last year, we submitted the LEDs, our LEDs, as well as our 2030 NDC. And last April uh, 22nd, as our minister has just mentioned, uh, President Moon has said that we will be having a more ambitious NDC presented to the UN this year. And what we're doing is that until June of this year, we will decide the most cost-effective and most useful path ways for our society in terms of carbon neutrality. So once our pathways are set, we will then 
come up with different policy options that suit the different pathways. So we will be making that list. And then we will determine the timing, the implementation time for these policy options. And so we will go through those processes until the end of this year. And then we have the basic energy plan and basic power demand supply plan and other uh, different national plans in which these policy options will be reflected. So right now, we are also uh, in the process of legislating a carbon neutrality act. So once we have that act go into force, we will have the legal foundations to pursue policies and programs to reach carbon neutrality. So that is one thing that I want to emphasize. And I do want to also mention just transition, which is very important for us. So we're going to see a lot of difficulties in different sectors. And so to help them, we will establish the Climate Change Response Fund to provide appropriate assistance. So for industrial transition or for the to ease the difficulties faced by the workers, we will be using this fund to provide various assistance. And from the next page onwards, very briefly, I show you the different sectors, energy industry and others. Uh, there as a situation and what will be done in these different sectors and what the core areas, the core policy options will be for each sector. For example, for energy, our coal-fired plants, what we are planning is that until uh, 2034, we will be shutting down 34 uh, plants. And uh, that is our existing plan. But once again, uh, we will be finalizing the pathways and then in the process of developing the policy options as a result, many of the programs will eventually die out. And so they and our goals will be strengthened as well. And so in industry sector also, developing new industrial technologies will be important. In transportation, our hydrogen cars and electric vehicles, uh, how we're going to expand the penetration of these vehicles will be included in the different core areas. And also waste until carbon sink also. We'll, well, we'll be planting a lot of trees. We will be taking care of our natural environment, conserving them in order to absorb as much carbon as possible. So that will be part of our plan. Next, I'd like to talk about our P4G Seoul Summit. Uh, it'll be held on May 30 and 31, and the leader session will be um, contactless uh, online meeting, and then we'll be having hybrid sessions for the remaining thematic and special sessions. And I believe that uh, this the details of this slide has been explained to you or delivered to you already. Uh, but anyhow, we have many different sessions that we will be hosting. We have a lot of stakeholders from various sectors who will engage in discussions on various topics such as carbon neutrality and the climate change, and also reaffirming the commitment towards um, implementation. So there will be business forums where businesses will participate. We have a society, civil society forum attended by civil society also. And for local governments, they will have their own conference. And also for the younger generation, the youth, there will be uh, discussion sessions for them as well. For the topics, we have forests, oceans, biodiversity, and others. And also we will be dealing with technology, uh, financing, and funding, and Green New Deal, and many others. So we will have, we will be discussing a lot of different topics with many stakeholders through various programs at the P4G. So we look forward to, to your interest and participation. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. If you're listening to the Ministry of Environment's major progress of the policies and also the P4G uh, planning, thank you very much for the presentation. And now we will have a Q&A session with our foreign journalists. Uh, we will have both online questions and offline questions. We will receive them separately. For those who have questions, please raise your hands. And when you are uh, designated, please uh, introduce your affiliation and your name and uh, 
Deliver your questions, please. And we'll now like to begin our Q&A session. Are there any questions? If you have questions, please raise your hands. Uh, minister, just I know you're not energy minister, you're environmental minister, but can I ask you about renewables? Um, I was looking at the data this morning. I was astounded that Korea, which is a, a G10 uh, country, not only is last in the percentage of uh, renewables in its national energy mix, but I mean, is distantly last. Canada, 27%. Germany, 17%. UK, 14%. Japan, 9%. China, 12%. Korea, less than 3%. Uh, can you explain to me, you know, Korea has mountains for hydro, it's got offshore wind, it's got high tides in the West Sea. Why has Korea not invested in renewables? Why this incredible lag for the world's 10th richest country? Thank you. For your questions so related to renewable uh, investment, well, it is true that we did not actually have a very uh, fast-paced development. So for this year, we have plans for the wind power generation. We aim to facilitate its development through a one-stop legislation. We understand that within April and May, uh, the legislation will be passed at the National Assembly. You mentioned it's around 3 percent, but as of last year, I understand that it did go up to about 6 percent. And as of 20, by 2030, uh, we plan. No, 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 no. Just only. In the basis of 2020, it's 6 percent. Yep. Uh, <laughs> So, by 2030, our plan is to raise a portion of 20 to 20 percent out of the entire energy mix. For the one-stop legislation for a wind power gen wind generation, we will kind of speed up its uh, development because uh, related to offshore wind or solar generation, we actually are very uh, progressive. And uh, I think its overall uh, grid development is actually not far catching up with its uh, development. So we are even witnessing a certain waste. So when you consider that, even though our plan is 20 percent by 2030, I believe that we can be optimistic that we can actually outpace our goal. And in order to actually realize that goal, we will continue to speed up the process. Thank you. Well, before we go on to the next question, please remember to use the microphone because we are being broadcasted live right now. So if you do not use the microphone, the audience cannot hear you. And please identify yourself before asking the question. I am Meng Ju Sok from Sky News of the UK. As of the moment, under the fact that we have COVID pandemic going on, there are a lot of medical waste that is being produced. Is it being treated well? Is it incinerated or are there other ways of treating these types of waste? That is my first question. Second question is, because of the COVID pandemic, We've seen a lot of the production of uh, waste, plastic waste and plastic bags, a lot of industrial waste as well. In the case of Seoul City, for example, the, it doesn't have enough capacity to treat all these uh, waste, and so they are planning to send that to Incheon or other cities. But that is not a fundamental solution to this problem. So this industrial waste, just uh, sending them to landfills or you know, incinerating them, that's going to in increase other problems such as uh, air pollution. So I believe that there are also technologies that will re uh, make these waste, change these waste to energy. So is there any policy that the Ministry of Environment is interested in with regards to these technologies? So you gave two questions. First is the medical waste. Uh, is it being incinerated or is it being going to the landfill? Well, we are all incinerating uh, them. We are all burning those uh, waste up right now. And secondly, for the medical waste and the increase, there has been indeed an increase in the use of uh, 
waste, plastics, and because of the increase in delivery due to COVID-19. So in order to reduce the um, amount of plastic that's being used, well, if we cannot avoid using it all together, we are opting to reduce the amount of uh, or the size of the plastic that is being reduced. And secondly, there are a lot of demonstrated technologies also. So we are going into industrialization for some of the technologies. So we can use the uh, plastics to go through uh, different treatments to use them as uh, energy sources. Also, there's gasification technologies to, to turn them into uh, energies which we can use. So we will be having those demonstration projects go into implementation from next year. And yes, we do have some incineration sites in Seoul, but and so that is why the Incheon landfill is being utilized for the Seoul uh, waste. But then from 2026, landfill will be banned altogether in the metropolitan areas, and from 2030, it will be impossible altogether. And so uh, minimizing the production of waste, the plastics, would be one option. And then aside from that, if we're going to um, incinerate some of the waste, we could try to recover some heat energy to use it as an energy sor source. And a few days ago, I did meet with Mayor O oh of uh, uh, Seoul, but anyhow, the local governments here in the metropolitan area, this is an issue that they have to, the leaders have to come together to engage in discussion. Of course, we have to follow our principle. From 2026, the uh, landfills will be banned. And so with that as a basic principle, we will find ways to have coexistence. Thank you. Uh, next question, please. I'm from Bloomberg. I'm Hisu. And NDC, you uh, plan to upgrade the NDC within this year. So, what is the overall range that is being predicted? So, uh, I know that it has not been finally determined, but what is the overall projection of the Ministry of Environment? And as for the Stopping a public financing to new coal-fired plants. Well, last year in Punggang in Vietnam, in Java project in Indonesia, there were still funding going to these overseas projects, and there were criticisms against those. So what the, is the position of the ministry on that? So within this year, we'll be raising our NDC goal, which was announced on the 22nd of April. But regards to the specific range, well, we are in the, the process of developing the 2050 scenario, and so there will be several different pathways that will be determined. So we have different options. So when we say different options because each sector would have a different uh, duration, different goals. So the Carbon Neutrality Committee will come up with the most optimal plan the, of the framework, and based on that, we will have an NDC, 2030 NDC, and a 2050 NDC, the pathway determined at that time. So as of the moment, it's difficult for us to tell you the range specifically. But anyhow, our president has made that commitment, and as a part of the path towards 2050, I mean, what is the maximum that we can do to be successful in this process? So we have to think about that, and we have to ensure that the stakeholders are all involved. When we have, when we set a specific number, it has to be something that is realistic. We need to have a realistic goal because that will motivate the stakeholders to participate. But if we set a goal that is impossible to reach, I mean, that's not going to be feasible. And so we have to have a realistic goal in which all stakeholders can be involved. So we will go through a lot of discussions to set our final goal. And we have someone from Vietnam here, but with regards to our investments overseas, such as Vietnam, well, we've had continued discussions on what we can do, but there is the issue of diplomacy that we need to consider because these are uh, promises that we made to other countries. And so uh, of obviously, if the host country does not want it, then we will not have to provide the public financing. However, for the pro promises that we've already made, we're going to try to find ways to minimize the uh, em GHG emissions for these existing projects, which we have promised already.
Um, anyone else? Uh, and another question? Yes. I'm from ABC News. I'm uh, uh, PDE uh, for the bio. Uh, for the bio. The degradable plastic, uh, um, I understand that there isn't a separate um, way of collecting such biodegradable plastics. So for the separation of collection of uh, plastic waste, uh, I'd like to ask for your elaboration. Well, for the biodegradable plastic, it is quite simple. If you want to recycle them, actually the de biodegradable plastic could actually be a hurdle to such recycling, as a matter of fact. So we have made certain designations. It's kind of, for example, for the plastic uh, floating uh, signs in the uh, on offshore. For such plastic, we plan to use biodegradables. And for the existing uh, biodegradable plastic, when we compare the new updated plastic compared to the existing ones, well, for the existing ones, it, it has to be uh, it has to set a certain uh, temperature, about 50 to 60 uh, Celsius uh, range. But we see uh, quite improvement in uh, the technological development when uh, the plastic could be biodegraded, degradable at the uh, room temperature as well. And so we are thinking of the uh, agricultural films that are used in the rural areas. So within about three to four months, they could be biodegradable on the room temperature or on the, all the actual outdoor uh, temperature. And if this is feasible, we plan to actually implement its application. Many industrial companies are working on developing biodegradable plastics. Uh, but if this is uh, you to go under the existing recycle system, this cannot be recycled in the existing manner. So we plan to collect them in different uh, plastic packages. So we do have pure bioplastics being developed. And so we have long-term uh, review of these uh, technologies. And we are following up with the technology development in these cases. And Anyone with the next question, please raise your hand. We have not received any online questions so far. Hello, I am from Xinhua News Agency. I'd like to ask about um, fine dust, PM 2.5. The fine dust issue is an issue that both the Chinese and the Korean people are very much interested in. And Korea and China, through bilateral cooperation, these issues have to be resolved. And so Korea and China right now, what are we, what are you cooperating or how are you cooperating in order to address the issue of fine dust? Thank you. Thank you very much for the excellent question. So for PM 2.5 or other fine dust problem, yes, there are uh, roles that should be played by all different stakeholders because the air we breathe in is not limited to air just in Korea. Air obviously flows through different countries. And so it's something that we need to, we all need to be interested in. We all need to work on reducing. So in the case of our relations with China, well, in fact, we had discussions with the Chinese officials also recently. We do have a system in place for early predictions uh, for fine dust. So uh, if we could have one week early uh, predictions, uh, forecasts. So we suggested to have a hotline established in order to have these early forecasting, which China was very receptive to, and also engaging in our own reduction measures uh, in each country and exchanging information about these types of F uh, efforts. So we also agreed on that also. And what China mentioned recently is that, well, its goal is until 2025, but it's going to try to reduce fine dust as much as possible by 2025. And so uh, sharing information in regards to these plans of uh, the other countries, another thing that we are working on. Deputy Minister Huang, would you like to add? 
Uh, the ministers of China and Korea have annual meetings, a minimum of one time meeting per year. China is pursuing uh, various policies and as well as Korea also. So we do some comparisons to learn from each other and we try to learn the good policies of China as well and vice versa. And we also have online and regional um, working level cooperation that continues on today. So just like Korea, China has had a lot of progress and achievement and China has also was able to improve its fine dust problem by about 20 percent. And uh, it's the same for and the pollutants uh, being reduced in China has obviously helped Korea as well. In the case of last year, well, this year we're still in the process of analyzing. But in the case of last year, we were able to reduce fine dust by about 20 percent because of the efforts of China. Uh, that is what we have determined so far. And so between our two countries, we have very close relations, particularly between our ministers, and we have very deep uh, cooperation with China. Are there any following questions? Please raise your hands. I'm a Shin Sung Help from The Diplomat. And for the foreign correspondents here, uh, I believe that uh, you have mainly been interested in uh, the policies themselves. So I'd like to ask a following question about the so-called continuity of the policies. Just as President Moon said, uh, the 2050 uh, carbon neutrality is a very challenging goal. In order to realize the goal, I believe there will be many tasks that should be continued. Uh, and it should be quite safe independent and uh, protected from um, diplomatic and political changes. So I want to ask uh, Minister Han if uh, that could be guaranteed. For the carbon neutrality, that is not a political rhetoric. So I believe uh, that is why we could say that it could be consistent. Carbon neutrality, if you say that Korea is the only nation in the world that is pursuing a carbon neutrality, then people might criticize it as being something political. But carbon neutrality is a matter of uh, human survival in the entire world. So if there is any government or leader that is not active in responding to that. Actually, I do not believe such a leader would exist in the world. So whoever is the following presidency after President Moon, the carbon neutrality is a way forward for us to go. It would be a matter of which would be the best solution, but I do not believe that there will be any a lack of consistency in the, in the, in the future. This is also an international promise in the international community. It isn't something that we do not want to do. It is something that is a must for all of the international community members. We have to join in the path. So I am truly confident that uh, carbon neutrality should not be in the political realm. It should be free of politics. So that is why we have to be faithful to uh, reaching that goal by 2050 uh, by uh, resorting to all possible measures. Yes, the person in front. Questions, please, to Mr. Kim and to Minister Han. Uh, Deputy Minister, you, s you, you were talking rather vaguely about biodegradable plastics, which is one of the holy grails of industrial products in the world today. Um, and Korea's got a very strong petrochemical industry. Realistically, when could we see a commercially viable biodegradable plastic hit the market? And, and Minister, just uh, to, to just follow up on my earlier point, if our figures correspond, Korea doubled its use of renewables between 2019 and 2020. Can you give some detail on, you know, how that was done, what assets were deployed, uh, and where? Thank you. For the mixed bioplastics from the petrochemical industry, yes, 
uh, it requires separate, uh, separate separation, which leads to low level of recycling. So as our minister has mentioned, in some uses, yes, it can be used, but then it's difficult for us to expand the use dramatically. And so until 2030, our focus will be to reduce the or limit the use of uh, these uh, plastics. For the bioplastics or plant-based plastics, the technologies are still being developed. We are not at the phase of commercialization yet. So it's going to be after 2030 when we will have commercialization. And so depending on the pace of technology development, uh, the timing of uh, commercialization will be determined. With regards to renewables, Yes, we were able to increase our renewables share because oh, particularly in solar PV and the uh, wind industries. According to our statistics, it's 6%, as I mentioned earlier. But yes, we are generating the energy, but it is not being connected to the grid properly. That's why we have some fluctuations or differences in the proportion of the renewables, which we are calculating. But anyhow, still 6% in the total um, energy production, I think that's uh, true. Next question, please. I'm Song Jong-ha from Financial Times. About the Paris Agreement, uh, I'd like to ask a couple of questions. And uh, how close are we near the target under the Paris Agreement? And in order to reach the target, what are the major tasks and uh, what are the major challenges? I'd like to ask for your elaboration on these details. Well, there are uh, many uh, challenges, as a matter of fact. and. These challenges exist in all different sectors, as a matter of fact. And just as been mentioned, uh, conversion or energy switch is most critical uh, because we have a high dependency on fossil fuels in our overall industry. So in terms of energy switch, especially uh, switch, in especially in the energy sector, is something that we should set as a priority. And also in the industrial sector, among the different sectors, there are uh, the high emission uh, industries and just take a big portion in our industry structure. So we have to focus on technological innovation for these industries. And that is another critical challenge for us. And it is true that we are highly dependent for overseas energy and it is also uh, it also has to do with our high dependency on export. So for EU and e US, uh, we are even uh, facing a so-called carbon tax or carbon border tax. So if our, we want to maintain our international competitiveness in the global market, I think a uh, way toward green and the development of green technology is a must for Korean country companies. So we have uh, the so-called 10 core goals or targets for energy switch uh, in the steel or cement or petrochemical sectors. Uh, we will focus our investment in the R&D for these sectors. And as a matter of fact, I believe these are the two main areas, industry on the one hand and energy on the other hand. And for the other areas, the Korean government should also speed up its pace. That is another must. Solar generation or wind generation, we want to increase the portion. But to, for solar generation, we do not have a, that much flat land. We have high-rise buildings, on the other hand. So we could think of uh, utilizing such uh, architectures for energies and uh, energy generation and could also promote policies to remodel the existing buildings and to construct new buildings to be more energy efficient. And that is a main area that the current government is focusing on, as a matter of fact. So within this year, we could think of the Paris Agreement and 2050 carbon neutrality. And it is true that we have many goals and tasks, but this year, we believe, is when we will set the overall groundwork. 
And if that groundwork is laid successfully, then I think next year is when we will actually speed up the implementation. So that is the overall uh, vision that, I ha that we have in mind. Next question, please. I am Pei Songjun from Fujita TV. So I'd like to ask you a question to the minister. Yesterday, the, there was, it's the issue of the nuclear uh, energy or nuclear waste water that is will be emitted by Japan. And according to an um, association, announcement yesterday, it will have a lot of uh, different um, crisis that it will lead to. So with regards to the Japan's filtering plans, which would announced, well, Korea, what, what is the position of the Ministry of Environment on this announcement from Japan? With regards to the polluted water release decision by Japan, Was that the best possible choice uh, for the country? Well, I'd like to ask Japan this question because according to the academic societies, well, Japan is saying that it has gone through a primary treatment process, so it has been all treated well. But then if you look at the actual contents of the water, you will see that the level of treatment is actually uh, insufficient. And so what Japan is saying right now is everything Thing will be treated well, the water will be treated well, and then they will release it. But then, in actuality, it's going to be difficult to attain that level of treatment. And so for the neighboring countries, including Korea, we are very uh, concerned about it uh, because uh, from the position of the government, we have to think about the health of our people first. So that's why we could raise the issue of whether that was the best choice for Japan. Uh, and so. I would like to raise this issue also to Japan and ask them, was this really the best choice that they could make? Uh, because, you know, there are other alternatives such as increasing the uh, period or duration of storage, some, according to some academics. That's one option that is being presented. So there are other alternatives that we could consider. So what you are saying right now is that, well, all of the preconditions being met and then there are no problems and then uh, that will be implemented. But the problem right now is that these preconditions are not being met in the first place. That's why everyone is concerned. That's why China and Korea also, we are saying that we have to be part of the IAEA inspection team. And so it's, we have to go through the inspection process to ensure that all of the treatment processes are implemented and then it, the, the pollution, wa polluted water will be released. And so who will be responsible for that entire process? So these are some challenges that remain. And the data for the primary treatment also is not transparent. So we have to raise issue with that for the, to the lack of transparency. Uh, uh, from the neighboring countries to Japan. And so the Japanese government will have to look through these issues raised by the neighboring countries. Yes, I do see that possibility. One more question is, according to this academic society's announcement, say because of the politically motivated uh, concern raised uh, by Japan, uh, the, it is increasing the level of anxiety of the neighboring countries. That is their conclusion. So what do you think about this conclusion? Well, I think it's true because, you know, we have to ensure that this is not misused politically. But then the, the, we, there needs to be transparent disclosure of information, transparent of things as is to ensure that this issue is not politicized so that we can assess whether indeed this is a problem or not. So. These are still challenges that remain. And then what can we do about that? So we need to have the disclosure of uh, data in a transparent fashion in the first place. That's why, but we have not had that. That's why we are raising issue with this. So transparent disclosure is the first and most important precondition. And also for transparent disclosure, 
uh, if Japan is willing to accept other countries' participation, I mean, it should be willing to allow other countries to participate to ensure transparent disclosure. Yes, so for transparent disclosure, the participation of the neighboring countries, other countries should be guaranteed. Yes. To time consideration, uh, I'm afraid you could, we can receive just one or two questions. My question relating to P4G soon summit. Um, how many countries will enjoy the summit? And at the end of the summit, is there uh, a, an agreement, possible agreement among member countries, or uh, does the lead uh, uh, issue a joint statement or something like that? Uh, well, as of now, uh, for the real-time participants, we understand about uh, 12 to 15 member of, uh, nations will attend. Uh, we have 12 nations that have confirmed their participation, and we also have three additional nations that are actively considering their participation. So there's a possibility that the number will grow to 15. And also, we have received uh, notices from nations that will attend not real time, and this number is around 35 nations. But in terms of an agreement, uh, this will be limited to the real time uh, attending um, uh, nations, which will be about 12 to 15 uh, nations. So we believe that the joint declaration will be uh, based on such 12 to 5, 15 in ma uh, nations for the P, uh, for uh, the uh, P4G summit. And for the additional details, in the case of the leaders' uh, summit, leaders' meeting, we will have the heads of different countries participate, and for international organizations as well as other participants from different countries, we will have a separate session for that as well. And we will have 15 different thematic breakout sessions as well. In the case of Ministry of Environment, we'll be in charge of water and circular economy, and uh, we have the carbon neutrality local government's implementation uh, session as well. So we will have the industry, civil society all participating, and this is going to be an online session as well, which means that we will have participation from all over the world. Also, in that process, we will have uh, the different the discussions from the different sessions, particularly with regards to carbon neutrality, as for also with collabor on cooperation with the developing countries, uh, that will all be a part of the Seoul Declaration, which we will announce eventually. We will receive one last question. And Since uh, we have reached our time, I would now like to conclude our Q&A. And now I'd like to invite Minister Han uh, for her closing remarks. Considering the time limit, uh, this was a quite short uh, forum, but I could understand your passionate interest in uh, Korea's uh, carbon neutral policies and find us policies uh, through your questions and uh, views. You even talked about landfills, and this showed a high level of interest. So on our part, we are very excited and encouraged for that and grateful. In order to overcome uh, this climate change challenge, we have to collaborate and work together and work towards the 2050 carbon neutrality hand in hand. And so. I believe that we should uh, increase these types of opportunities so that we could communicate more frequently, so that we could communicate the details of our carbon neutral policies with uh, foreign journalists in Korea. And I'd like to ask for your continuous interest and support. And also, I understand that many host agencies have uh, played a very big part for making today's policy forum possible. So I'd like to extend my gratitude. Thank you very much. With that, we'd like to conclude the KPC Korea Policy Forum with Minister of Environment Han Jong-e. And for the members of the uh, COSIS and uh, the MCST, I'd like to extend my gratitude.